Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I just lost my place. We're at. Act three, scene two. <clears throat> And the play within the play has just ended, page 1290. <clears throat> Hamlet asks Horatio. He says, line 258, 259. <clears throat> A good Horatio, I'll take the ghost word for a thousand pound. Didst perceive? Very well, my lord. Upon the talk of the poisoning, I did very well note him. Okay? So. Why does he have that conversation with Horatio? It's because if you go back, something I didn't discuss with y'all, but I did with my second class, on page 1284, also at three, scene two, it's kind of at the beginning, Hamlet says to Horatio, lines 51 and following, uh, take that back, line 52, since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and could have been distinguished her election, she has, look at that, she has sealed thee for herself. For thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing. A man that fortunes, buffets, and rewards has taken with equal thanks. Okay? So, let me spend a couple minutes to discuss that scene. Or, excuse me, those lines. <clears throat> Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and could have been distinguished her election, she had sealed thee for herself. Hamlet means, since I was able, that is from the point in time when I was old enough to be able to determine who is a friend and who isn't a friend, all right? It's kind of like if you're familiar with the Harry Potter stories. In the first Harry Potter story, when Harry's on the train, he meets Malfoy, Draco Malfoy, for the second time. And Malfoy offers his friendship and says, I know who are the good people to connect with. And Harry says, I think I can determine that for myself, okay? What Hamlet is saying here is, I have tested and tried our friendship, okay? Look at what he says, those following lines. For thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing. One day last week, I think somewhere over here, I put the phrase up. Fair weather friends. Okay? Horatio is not a fair weather friend. A fair weather friend is someone who only sticks to you when everything is going well, when everything is going great for you. All right? Polonius' advice to his son Laertes before he went back to France included what statement? Anybody remember? He says, test your friends, and those friends who are tested, that is, those friends who stick by you through thick and thin, do what? Grapple them as with steel to your soul. Okay? Look at what Hamlet just said. Since my dear soul was mistress of her choice and could have been distinguished her election, she hath sealed thee, grappled thee for herself for thou hast been as one in suffering all that suffers nothing a man that fortunes buffets and rewards oh that the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune okay that fortunes buffets its beatings right and its rewards so if you think of that wheel its buffets are when fortune is going downwards taking one down to the bottom its rewards are when fortune is rising one up Okay, has taken with equal things. So he's telling us there, I can trust Horatio no matter what. Horatio will, will be with me through thick and thin. So after the play within the play, he says to Horatio, 
did you catch what just happened? And Horatio says, yes, I did. Okay. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come in. Back on page 1290, lines 268 and following. They want to talk to Hamlet. Why? Were Rosencrantz and Guildenstern at the play within the play? More than likely, yes. I don't remember if they were actually described at the... Yes, they were. Um, line 37 or so, we're told. Enter Polonius, Guildenstern, and Rosencrantz. Okay? They again enter... Um, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern then leave. They again enter just before line 80. So they're all there for the play within the play. Okay? So why do they come in now? A word. Hamlet. Sir, a whole history. Okay? Notice what Hamlet does. Guildenstern says, we would like a word with you. Hamlet says, you can have more than a word. You can have an entire history. Okay? The king, what of him, is in his retirement marvelous distempered. It's a fancy way of saying what? Upset. Yeah, he's pissed. That's what he needs. Okay? With drink, distempered, Hamlet's using the temper like in the early 20th century, the temperance society, the anti-drinking kind of league. No, not that kind of distemper, right? No, my lord, rather with choler. That is, he's angry. Hamlet, your wisdom should show itself more richer to signify this to his doctor. In other words, why are you telling me? Go talk to his doctor about that. For, for me to put him to his purgation would perhaps plunge him into far more choler. Okay, look at your boss for, I hope, I haven't looked at it, for caller, 274 or so. Bilious disorder with quibble on the sense anger. Doesn't help a lot. Caller was one of the, what are called the humors. It is something that arises from the blood, okay? But it is characterized by coming from bile. And it is anger. Anybody, Harry Potter reference. Anybody know Ron's middle name? It's bilious. It means full of anger. Ron's a ginger, redhead. What is the myth about redheads? They're hot-tempered. I mean, you just doesn't take much to set them off. So Hamlet is saying, because the Renaissance notion of medicine, part of the Renaissance notion, involved treating the four humors. Okay? treating these kind of spirits that the body produces. So if one is heavy in one thing, you counter it with something else. So, Gildenstern, uh, Hamlet says, for me to rid him of the collar that he's full of would probably bring about more collar, that is, more anger. Good, my lord, put your discourse into some frame that is, make sense. Okay? Gildenstern doesn't understand what Hamlet's saying. And start, no so, start not so wildly from my affair. That is, come back to what I'm talking about. I am tame, sir. That is, okay, you've, you've corrected me. Produce, speak. Tell me what's wrong. Excuse me, pronounce. The queen, your mother, in most great affliction of spirit, hath sent me to you. Why has the queen, queen sent for Hamlet? What is part of the plot? Not, not plot of the play. The plot against Hamlet. Polonius was going to get her involved, and he was going to hide in there. So Polonius has already loosed his daughter on him with he and Claudius watching. After that, the king said, this isn't love. Madness and great ones unwatched must not go, okay? And Polonius says, I'll contrive it 
so that Hamlet has an interview with his mother and I'll secretly be watching. He still thinks it's love. Polonius does, right? So, now who's involved in that plot? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Okay. So, Ham Guildenstern says, Hamlet replies, you are welcome. Nay, good my lord, this courtesy is not of the right breed. In other words, why are you saying you are welcome? Has Guildenstern said anything to Hamlet, like, thank you, that requires a, you are welcome? No, he hasn't. That's what he means. Your response is not the right breed. Your response is a non sequitur, is what he means. Okay? If it shall please you to make me a wholesome answer, that is, one that is to the point, what kind of answer would that be? I'll go see mom right away. Okay? I will do your mother's commandment. If not, your pardon and my return shall be the end of my business. That is, I will leave. Sir, I cannot. What, my lord? That is, you can't what? Make you a wholesome answer. Hamlet is saying, I cannot make you wholesome. Honest, true, and such. My wit's diseased. But sir, such answer as I can make, you shall command, or rather, as you say, my mother. Therefore, no more, but to the matter. My mother, you say. Um, your behavior has struck her into amazement and admiration. Not admiration the way we understand it. Like to look up to somebody. Admiration meaning she's astonished. She's kind of like, what in the world is wrong with Hamlet? Hamlet, oh, wonderful son that can so astonish a mother. So, what does she want? She desires to speak with you in her closet. Notice it has taken uh, from line, when the mother is first referred to, line 280, it's taken to 295 or so to get to the point. Hamlet, we shall obey, were she 10 times our mother. Anything else you want to say? Have you any further trade? Rosencrantz, my lord, you once did love me. Somebody else said something like that. It's only slightly different. Hamlet told Ophelia, I did love you once. Hamlet, I do still. By these pickers and stealers, line 300. By these hands, that is, I still love. What's wrong with you? That is good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. What is wrong? What is with your distemper? Why are you out of temper? Out of normal? Okay. I lack advancement. What's he mean by advancement? What should Hamlet be? King. Okay. Earlier when they talked, what did both Rosencrantz and Guildenstern harp on? He that he was the prince and the next it was his ambition that was causing his problems. Okay, Hamlet says now, I lack advancement. What's he doing? Into that. He's playing into that. He is playing into what they think about him. Okay, because he knows what they're all about. How? When you have the voice of the king himself for your succession. How, how do you lack advancement when the king has already said, you are next in line? Hamlet, aye, but while the grass grows, proverb is something musty, okay? The rest of the proverb is the silly horse starves. Hamlet may be destroyed while he is waiting for the, for the succession to the kingdom, okay? And the players come in with recorders. You know, like the recorders 
If you went to school in Rutherford County, you took recorder lessons in like third or fourth grade, those kinds of things. Hamlet grabbed one. Okay. And he says to Gilwinster, will you play upon this pipe? And he tries to hand it to him. I, I, I cannot. I pray you. I, I can't. I beseech you. I know no touch of it, my lord, that is. I don't know how to make it make music. Tis as easy as lying. Hamlet's point, you do that very well. If you can lie as easily as you do, surely you can do this. Govern these vintages, that is the holes, with your fingers and thumb, give it breath with your mouth, and it will discourse most eloquent music. These are the stops, and he kind of shows them. But these cannot, I command, to any utterance of harmony. That is, if I put my fingers on the stops and put my thumb here and blow, what are you going to get? Noise. Okay? I have not the skill. Hamlet, he turns the tables. What should Rosencrantz and Guildenstern know after this speech. Knows Say that louder. Hamlet knows, lying. Hamlet knows they're lying. Hamlet knows they're spying. Hamlet seemingly knows everything about them. So here's that speech. Why look you now. How unworthy a thing you make of me. You would play upon me. Play there has multiple means, right? One of them is like I'm a recorder. What's another one? One of the themes that I've talked about. Play, act, pretend. Okay. You would play upon me. You would seem to know my stops. You would pluck out the heart of my mystery. Pluck as in plucking on a harp. In other words, you would try to find my music, what makes me move. You would sound me from my lowest note to the top of my compass, and there is much music, excellent voice in this little organ. In other words, and if I wanted to, oh, oh I could talk, I could say things. Yet cannot you make it speak. In this little organ, 329 or so, musical instrument, i.e. the pipe, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the recorder. He's talking about himself. And I think, you know, Hamlet shouldn't point to the recorder. He should say, in this little organ, his heart. Yet cannot you make it speak? It's blood. It's blood. God's blood. It's an oath. By God's blood. Do you think I'm easier, easier to be played on than a pipe? Call me what instrument you will, though you can fret me like fingers, okay, your gloss, quibble on meaning irritate in the piece of wood, gut, or metal, which regulates the fingering. Though you can fret me, you cannot play upon me. That is, you can't figure out my music. You can't figure out what motivates me. Polonius comes in. You notice. Polonius, for once, seemingly the first time, he gets directly to the point. With no matter, excuse me, with no art, my lord, the queen would speak with you, and presently, that is, now. Hamlet says, okay, after a little bit. Notice, he sees a cloud. Doesn't that look like a camel or a weasel? Or... Why? He's 
feigning madness. He's pretending to be antic. Question. Is Lois getting to the point so quick only because like this whole thing is his plan? Yeah, he wants him to go off so he can spy. So he can listen to Hamlet. Okay? So, everyone leaves but Hamlet. Another soliloquy. We get Hamlet's real thoughts now. Tis now the very witching time of night. When churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. Now could I drink hot blood. Okay. And do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. Drinking hot blood, by the way, both in Old Testament and New Testament violation. Old Testament, you don't drink blood. You don't taste blood. You don't eat meat boiled in blood, right? You don't leave blood alone. I mean, you leave blood entirely alone. Why? It's the life essence of the living thing, okay? Now he says, I could drink hot blood, who? And I could do horrendous murder. Soft. Why soft? Calm down. Calm down, Hamlet. Why? I've got to go to my mother. What did the ghost say? Leave your mother alone. Leave your mother to heaven. O oh, heart, lose not thy nature. He's telling himself, don't go against your mother. Let not ever the soul of Nero enter this firm bosom. Okay, Murderer of his mother. Hamlet's kind of telling us. What's he thinking as he's getting ready to go off and talk to his mother? Part of him kind of wants to kill her. Okay? That's why he's saying, don't let me be like Nero. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. Unnatural against Nature. Killing one's parents is against nature. I will speak daggers to her, but use none. So what's he going to use against her? His word. Keep going. He's going to say hurtful things to her. He's going to guilt manipulate her, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just going to lay it all out there. Okay? My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites. How in my words, some ever she be shent. You've got a gloss there. Rebuked. To give them seals, never my soul consent. Okay? That is to confirm with deeds. However much he wants to convict her, he can't do anything. All right? So, scene three. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern enter with the king, and it's probably clear, I think it ought to be clear, that as they enter, they're talking. They've been talking in another room when they enter on the stage. All right? Uh, king, I like him not. Nor stands it safe with us to let this madness rage. So, he says, prepare yourselves you're going to take Hamlet to England, okay? We'll provide for ourselves, don't worry. Um, King says, arm you, that is, get weapons to protect yourselves. So they leave, Polonius comes in. Polonius says, he's going to his mother's closet, I'll hide behind the heiress. Notice seemingly every room has a curtain. Well, if you know anything about castles, they're drafty. So there are wall hangings everywhere in castles, okay, to help block the draft. So Polonius leaves. Claudius gets a soliloquy. And what does he tell us? It's a fairly long one. Goes from line 36 to 72. Oh, my offense is rank. 
it smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Cain and Abel. Pray can I not. I can't pray. I can't ask for forgiveness. Why? It's because my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. His intent is to pray and ask for forgiveness, but his guilt doesn't allow him to. And like a man to double business bound, I stand and pause where I shall first begin in both neglect to double business bound. A guy comes up to Jesus, or Jesus says, follow me. And the guy says, let me go bury my father first. And Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. Why? You cannot have two masters. It's drop everything. What's Claudius' problem? What are his two masters? I owe my allegiance, my loyalty, my devotion, etc., to God, but damn, Gertrude's good in bed. That's his problem. He still wants to enjoy the fruits of his actions. Okay? What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? He's talking to himself. Is not God's mercy great enough to forgive even this? Go back and read the Old Testament. Plenty of examples. Where to serve mercy but to confront the visage of offense? The visage, the face, the behavior. Okay? So he says, I'll look up my fault is past. I'm, I'm done with it. My sin was when I killed my brother. He's not thinking of the other sin, the incest. So how should I pray? Forgive me my foul murder? And I can't pray that. Why? Because I am still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. That is, I'm still enjoying the results which I saw it when I did the murder. What are the results? There's at least two of them. Kinship and Gertrude. What would he have to do, he is suggesting, and ha Shakespeare is suggesting, this is part of the theological you know, richness of this play, what must one do to have real contrition? You've got to give up the stuff that you got as a result of the sin. If you stole something, you have to make restitution. If you killed somebody, you have to make restitution of sorts. How do you do that? Is it, you know, life, eye for an eye, Old Testament, you know, judgment? Is it something else? He's got to figure that out. What are the effects? My crown, my ambition, my queen. May one be pardoned and the offense? Can you be pardoned, forgiven, and still keep on sinning? Go back to the minister's black veil. Final words. Lo, I look around me and on every face I see a black veil. The black veil isn't only the people hiding something, it's the sin of those individuals. Okay? So he goes on. What then? 64. What rests? Try what repentance can. I'll give it a shot. Okay. What can it not? What can repentance not achieve? Yet what can it when one cannot repent? O wretched state, O bosom black as death, O limed soul, that struggling to be free are more engaged. Help angels. Make a say, that is, make trial. Prove me repentant. Okay? And what does he do? He kneels. What is kneeling a demonstrable act of? Pray. Louder? Praying. Praying, could be. What else? Even before you get to the praying part. Humility. It's humbling. Okay? And Hamlet comes in. Now, Hamlet isn't literally, I don't think, 
entering the room that Claudius is in. Metaphorically or figuratively, it's like Hamlet walks by and sees the king. And he's alone. And Hamlet thinks, now might I do it, pet. Now he is praying. What's the it? Kill him. I can kill him now. He's all alone. He's praying. I could go up right behind him, right through the neck with the sword. And now I'll do it. Sounds like what's happening. Hamlet's pulling his sword out of the sheath. He's getting closer to Claudius. And so he goes to heaven. What's Hamlet doing as he's making his way towards Claudius? This gets back to his quote-unquote soliloquy at the beginning of Act 3. What causes the native hue of resolution to be overcast and look pale? Thought. Hamlet's thinking as he's going towards Claudius. And what's he thinking about? If I kill him now, what's going to happen? He's going to go to heaven because he's in the act of repentance. He is praying for mercy. Wait, that needs to be scanned. Like a line of verse needs to be scanned. Where are its accents? Where are its, you know, unaccented syllables? You say, wait, wait, pause. Let me stop here and think about this for a minute. A villain kills my father. And for that, I, his only son, do the same bill and send to heaven. There's a problem with that image. Um, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He says, he took my father grossly, full of bread. That is, he took my father fattened. Not with bread, not, it's not literal. What's the bread mean? full of his sins. It's not like his father went to a priest and confessed everything and then took a nap. Okay? With all his crimes broad blown as flush as may and how his audit stands, who knows his audit? How Hamlet Sr.'s soul stands, only God knows. But in our circumstance and course of thought, tis heavy with him. That is, from what we think down here, he's not doing so well. Why? Because he died with all his sins on him. What Hamlet slash Shakespeare is raising is what big issue? How do we know someone's final state before God? When Osama bin Laden was killed by the SEALs, you know, there was rejoicing and all this kind of stuff going on in the United States. And a very famous politician, former preacher, came out and said, and he's rotting in hell. And, you know, said it with glee. Okay? I was rather disgusted by that. And I was, you know, pretty, I'm even more right wing than I was then. But I really don't like any time anybody celebrates anybody's death, okay? Because what was being said there? That politician was essentially taking what position? I am now God, and I get to determine what someone's final state is, okay? That's what Hamlet says we do whenever someone dies. We kind of make an assumption based on how that person lived his or her life, okay? Kind of interesting when you think about that idea, that kind of theological conundrum, it's only in one gospel that the thief on the cross to the right of Jesus says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. It's like the other three gospels, writers, didn't hear it didn't know about that. 
So according to the other three gospels, both those on either side are what? They're described as railing against Jesus. It's like the fourth gospel, John's, who, according to the gospel, was sitting at the feet of the cross. It's like, John's the only one there to go, what was that? Jesus, can you repeat that for me? I didn't quite get that. Okay? From the perspective of everybody else, they're both going to hell. Okay? So, Hamlet says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do this. Up sword, he puts the sword back in its scabbard. And know thou a more horrid hint. Here's when I'm going to kill him. When he is drunk asleep. Or in his rage, full of anger. Why? Because anger is one of the seven deadly sins. Or, ooh, even better, in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. I'm going to sneak in to he and mom's bedroom and kill him when he's having sex with my mother. Kind of hard to kill him and not kill her at the same time, you know. Or at game, a swearing, or about some act that has no relish of salvation in it. That is, almost anything other but this. Okay? Then I'll trip him. Why? Think of the image. Because he's going to fall. And if he's going to fall, then his head is going to be pointed towards the earth. And metaphorically, where, where is hell? Down. And his feet will be pointed towards heaven. Hamlet leaves. Tragic decision, right? What's one, of, what's one of the definitions of tragedy? What's the definition I like to give? When a tragic hero has to make a decision but doesn't have all the information he needs to make that decision. What's the information Hamlet doesn't have? He leaves. My words fly up. My thoughts remain below. Meaning? not sincere right people can I mean I, I don't mean to harp on politicians but there's such good examples you know watch some politician you know and the politician might pray before something I can't it doesn't matter left or right I almost always look at them and I think of these lines what's it for or a politician who seemingly has never, you know, been a quote-unquote Christian or good person, and all of a sudden they're on the campaign trail and they have their, where is it, nice, shiny cross right out in front, you know, preferably white or silver or gold against a dark background so everybody can see. Look at my nice symbolism here. That's what is going on. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. Because thoughts are meant here to imply what? The heart. You have to be truly contrite. Okay? So, scene four. Yes? Um, so, was that, was Hamlet like actually going to follow through? Or was that part of him not being able to do what he said was again? Yes. <laughs> oh. It's both. What did he, you know, he began that episode, it's not quite a scene, saying what? Now I could do it. And so he starts, if I were directing it, there's Claudius, say out there, come on. Here's Claudius out here. Hamlet enters this doorway. He sees him and he starts walking toward him, towards him, silently. And as he's walking, he pulls out the sword. But as he's walking, he's talking. And what's he doing while he's talking? He's thinking. Okay, go back for just a moment. Thus conscience thus make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is simply over with the pale cast of thought. He thinks too much. Okay? You'll hear politicians who dither. 
about whether or not to get in a race, okay, they'll be called Hamlet. Or they'll be described as Hamlet-like, like they can't make up their mind. That's not the point. It's not that Hamlet can't make up his mind. It's that he thinks too much, okay? So, Hamlet goes into his mother's room. We see Polonius, he tells Gertrude kind of what to do. He says, I'm gonna hide behind this curtain, I'll listen to everything, okay? And Hamlet says, mother, mother, mother. And she says, go, hide, to Polonius. Hamlet comes in. Now, mother, what's the matter? Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. Thy father? Hamlet, mother, you have my father much offended. Who's the thy father versus my father? Claudius. Thy father is Claudius. My father, Hamlet Sr. Okay. Notice also. Hamlet, thou hast thy father, notice that pronoun, and Hamlet says, mother, you have my father. He doesn't say, mother, thou hast my father. Why not? The why forms we tend to think are more informal. They're not. Those why forms of the pronoun for the second person, you, your, those are the formal forms. Okay. The thy form is close, family. So she's saying Hamlet. It also indicates superiority, rank. Okay. Come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Notice now she switched from thy or thou to you. Why? She understands exactly what Hamlet means. And what is she doing by now using the formal Y form? She's distancing herself from her son. Okay? Go, go. You question with a wicked tongue. Okay? So they talk. Hamlet swears by the cross, etc., etc. And the queen says, line 20, Excuse me, Hamlet says, line 18, come, come, sit down. You shall not budge. You're not moving from here till when? You go not till I set you up a glass where you may see the inmost part of you. No, you're staying here because I'm going to hold a mirror up. Now, we didn't talk about it, but when Hamlet meets the players, okay, just before the play within the play, it's the second time he meets the players, what does he tell them about plays? The purpose of plays is to hold as twere, as it were, a mirror up to nature. That is, to hold a mirror up to people. So what do they see then? Themselves. Shakespeare gets this, by the way, from Aristotle. Aristotle said, the whole purpose of drama is to show us ourselves. So that when we see Oedipus, we should see ourselves and kind of walk away going, thus for the grace of God, go I. If I were put in Oedipus' shoes, I would do the same thing. Hopefully I'll never be in that position, okay? So, Helen says, I'm going to reveal to you your inmost secrets. What wilt thou do? Thou wilt not murder me. Help, help, ho! And we hear from behind the heiress. What ho? Help, help, help. Hamlet. How now? A rat. Dead for a ducat. And he stabs through the heiress. Okay? Who does Hamlet think he's stabbing? The king. It's like he doesn't recognize the voice. Polonius, I am slain. Okay. What have you done? Hamlet, I don't know. Is it the king? Come on, please God, please God, please God. Oh, what a rash and bloody deed is this. Rash? Yep. 
Notice what he didn't do. He didn't think about it. He just acted. A bloody deed, almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry with his brother. What did Hamlet just suggest about his mother? That she killed, that she killed Hamlet Sr. Kill a king? Notice she doesn't address the Mary, the brother. I didn't kill a king. I, lady, it was my word. And he lifts up the heiress, and there's Polonius slumped down. Thou wretched, rash, intruding fool. What did Hamlet tell Ophelia just after the to be or not to be speech? Where's your father? And she goes, I don't know. And that's when he tells her, tell him he should be a fool in his own house and do what not makes up with those greater than he is. I took thee for thy better. That is, I thought you were the king. What's that mean, by the way? What did Hamlet not intend to do? Kill Polonius. Take thy fortune. Fortune's wheel, it's still spinning. This is what you do. This is what happens when you do what? Get involved with great ones. When you stick your nose in the business of other people. Polonius' entire priest list of precepts to his son are all about essentially what? Don't get involved in other people's business. Listen to what they say. Don't give a word of advice. Don't get involved in arguments. But if you do, do it such that they don't want to get involved again. That's what Hamlet just did with Claudia, with Polonius. He's not going to get involved again, right? Take thy fortune. Thou finds to be too busy is some danger. Too busy <clears throat> means too involved, too connected. Leave wringing of your hands. He's talking to his mother now. She's sitting there going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, is he going to kill me next? Sit down. Let me wring your heart. Why? What needs to happen to her heart? Psalm 50 or 51, depending upon which version of the Old Testament you use. Okay. David cries out. This is after his uh, adultery with Bathsheba and murder of her husband is discovered. He says, break my heart. A contrite and broken heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. He says, let me wring your heart. For so I shall, if it be made of penetrable stuff, it, if it can be broken. If damned custom have not brazed it so. What's meant by custom? If something is customary, it is what to you? Tradition. Tradition, what else? We don't use tradition as much today. It's habit. If it is your custom to have a smoke, the first thing you do when you wake up, then what? You're addicted, right? Okay? If it is your custom to have a sip of Jack Daniels, old number seven, first thing in the morning, you're an alcoholic. It's habit. If damn custom have not braced it so that it be proof and bulwark against sins. He's saying, I'm going to so pry into your heart. If I'm able to, if her heart is so hard that it can't be done, then she's unreachable. What? What are you talking about? So he says, such an act that blurs the grace and blush of modesty, calls virtue hypocrite, takes off the rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love. What? Hmm. He's borderline there. Takes off the rose 
from the fair forehead of an innocent love and sets a blister there, makes marriage vows as false as Dicer's oaths. He's talking about her relationship with her, with her husband and then the relationship with Claudius. But by bringing up that rose from the fair forehead of an innocent love, I think Hamlet's also thinking of himself and Ophelia. Ophelia's been what? Turned against him. Oh, such a deed. Okay. She says, what act? What are you talking about? And Hamlet's like, really, Mom? Do I have to pull out the camera with the pictures? Look here upon this picture. And he pulls off, pulls out from somewhere, a picture of Hamlet Sr. Holds it right up to her face. Look, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. See what a grace was rested on this brow, his father. Hyperion's curls. Hyperion, the sun god's curls. So if the god has curly hair, guess what is the model of beauty? God's hair, okay? The front, the face of Jove himself, blah, 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 okay? So, here is dad. Now look what you have. Look you now what follows. Here is your husband. Like a mildewed ear. It's not this kind of ear. It's like an ear of corn. It's rotted. I don't know if you've ever picked corn before, but if you pick corn a little too late, sometimes you'll pick it and you'll shuck it. You pull the leaves off and it's just gooey and rank. Blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Like, come on, you're not that blind. Could you on this fair mountain, dad, Leave to feed and batten on this moor. Moor is unproductive land. Have you eyes? You cannot call it love. No, no, no. You're not attracted to this over here because of love. So it must be something else. At your age, the heyday in the blood is tame. You're too old for it to be because of the passion of sex. What judgment would step from this, Hamlet Sr., to this, Claudius? Okay. What devil, skipping a few lines, 77. What devil was it that thus hath cousined you at Hoodman Blind? How were you tricked to go from this to this? Right? Because Satan tricked Eve. The whole, the whole thing. All of evil, ultimately. It's a trick. It's like a magic act. It gets you to believe something that is what? An illusion. A false seeing. Eyes without feeling, feeling without sight, ears without hands or eyes, smelling sands, all. Or but a sickly part of one true sense, he says, shame. Where it, come on, why aren't you blushing? You should feel shame at this point. Okay? Hamlet, speak no more. Why? Thou turnest mine eyes into my very soul, and there I see such black and grainy spots as will not leave their taint. What did the ghost tell Hamlet? Taint not thy mind. Hamlet's words have just done what to Gertrude's? He's tainted. Not her mind, her soul. Or, put more properly, he's revealed the taint in her soul and she now sees it. Because what happens when we quote unquote, I don't care what your theological beliefs are, what happens when we quote unquote sin Perform a sin over and over and over and over and over and over and over. It becomes what? Second nature. It becomes natural. 
so that it's no longer considered to be a sin. Or use alcoholism. You take a drink, that doesn't mean you're alcoholic. You take two drinks, doesn't mean you're alcoholic. You drink, you know, a couple bottles of Jack or vodka or whatever a day, that pretty much means you're an alcoholic. But by that time, what often happens? You're no longer even aware of what you're doing. No, Hamlet says. No, I'm not going to stop. Why? To live in the rank sweat of an encemed bed. Yeah, and Shakespeare's playing on the sound of the word encemed. All it needs is what? One more consonant. Encemed bed. A bed covered with semen and bodily fluids. Stewed in corruption. The stews were what we today call whorehouses or brothels. They were where the hookers hooked up with their johns. Honeying and making love. Stop. Stop. No more sweet Hamlet. Okay? Now it's time. The ghost comes in, and that's where we are. I thought we would finish Act 3 today, but, you know, obviously not. Um, the ghost comes in, and that's where we're going to pick up on Friday. I've still, I've got the syllabus set up so that we can come compact the um, poems a little bit more than I have them. <clears throat>